Walking to Nibbana, A Guide to Walking Meditation by Bhikkhu Katukurunte Nyanananda Published by Putkulkala Dharma Grantha Dharma Sravana Madhya Bharya Sri Lanka 2015 Published strictly for free distribution. This book is available for free download at www.seeingthroughthenet.net. No spaces. This is being recorded by Bhikkhu Chandana in honor of the late Venerable Bhikkhu Katukurunde Nyanananda for his enormous contributions and relentless effort at disseminating the teachings of Lord Buddha, enriching the sasana with clearly defined descriptions and easy-to-follow steps that make the teachings, the Dhamma, accessible to all generations to come. May this recording be helpful. Contents The Cover Picture Introduction 1. The Importance of Walking Meditation 2. The Place for a Promenade 3. Advantages of Walking Meditation 4. Serenity in the Promenade 5. Insight in the Promenade and 6. Appendix The Cover Picture A Symbolic Representation of a Promenade Archaeologists have for a long time been grappling with the problem of interpreting the significance of the standing statue at the famous Gal Vihara in Polonnaruwa, Sri Lanka. Various interpretations have been put forward with a view to determining the exact motif of this historic artifact. We are of the opinion that this statue is a symbolic representation of the Buddha turning right about at the end of the promenade, or chankama, or walking meditation. Whereas the two statues on either side of this statue depict the Buddha in the seated posture and the reclining posture, we feel that this unique artifact symbolizes at once the two other postures, namely walking and standing. The following are the evidences we can offer in support of this conclusion. 1. The left foot shows a slight turn, and the right thigh suggests a protrusion. 2. The two arms lying relaxed on the chest could even be an indication of a more relaxed way of keeping the arms while on the chankamana. 3. The half-closed eyes are symbolic of the concentration that comes up in the standing posture at the end of the chankamana. 4. The depicting of the loose end of the robe hanging on the left shoulder could be an indication of a more relaxed and open way of robing while on the chankamana. 5. The circular pedestal with its lotus motif probably signifies the circle effortlessly drawn on either end of the chankamana if it is sand-strewn, by mindfully pacing up and down for a long time. Pace and Ponder Walk to Nibbana, 1st edition, 2015, September Sponsored by the PDDMB Introduction Chatuchakang Navadvarang 
पुन्नंग लोभेन संयुतं पंकचातं महावीर कथं यत्र भविष्यति चेतवा नढिं वरत्तंच इच्छा लोभंच पापकं समूलं तन्हं अब्बुह एवं यत्र भविष्यति from the Chatuchakka Sutta, Devata Sangyutta. The four-wheeled and nine-doored, this greed-bound heap born in mud, tell me how, O oh great hero, can there be for it an outlet? Cut off the thong and snap the rope, evil wish and greed as well. Pull out, craving with its root. That's how it can see an outlet. The four wheels alluded to in this riddle, verse, are the four postures the body assumes in the course of its daily routine. The body is always rolling on these four wheels. The journey to Nibbana is also a four-wheeled drive. The Buddha has clearly explained to us how these four wheels are made to roll towards Nibbana in the subsection on postures, in the section on body contemplation, in the Satipatthana Sutta. And again, monks, a monk, when going, knows, I am going, when standing, he knows, I am standing. When seated, he knows, I am sitting. When lying down, he knows, I am lying down. In whatever way his body is disposed, he understands that it is so disposed. Satipatthana Sutta Out of these four postures, the two most helpful for a meditator who has set out on the path to Nibbana are the seated posture and the walking posture, Chankamana. These two postures are greatly helpful in developing mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Quite a lot of books have been written on sitting meditation, but not enough attention has been given to walking meditation. This little book is an attempt to fulfill that need. Signed, Bhikkhu Katukurunde Nyanananda, January 2015, Buddhist Era 2558. The Importance of Walking Meditation In the practice of meditation leading to Nibbana, the two postures, sitting and walking, are mutually helpful. Generally, we depict the idea of meditation by the figure of a person seated in the cross-legged posture. For that very reason, the importance of walking meditation in the promenade, Chankamana, is very often overlooked. When the Buddha was explaining the path of practice recommended for attaining Nibbana with the help of a simile of taming a wild elephant, he presented the wakeful dwelling routine of an ideal meditator, Jagariyanuyoga, in the following words. Come, monk, dwell devoted to the practice of wakefulness. During daytime, Cleanse the mind of hindering qualities by pacing up and down, chankamena, and sitting, nisajjaya. In the first watch of the night, cleanse the mind of hindering qualities by pacing up and down and sitting. In the middle watch of the night, go to sleep in the lion's posture, reclining to the right side, placing one foot on the other mindful and fully aware, paying attention to the idea of waking up. In the last watch of the night, having got up, cleanse the mind of hindering qualities by pacing up and down and sitting. Pacing up and down and sitting 
provide that exercise and rest conducive to the balanced maintenance of wakefulness, because excessive walking tends to restlessness and excessive sitting tends to sloth and torpor. The particular order of the two words, chankamena nisajaya, is suggestive of the fact that pacing up and down in the chankamana should precede sitting. This is understandable since the activeness and the wakefulness aroused in the former posture helps the meditator to remain restful in the seated posture for a long time. However, one should not be hasty in returning to the chankamana as soon as drowsiness sets in while in the seated posture. This is what we can infer from the following set of instructions given by the Buddha to Venerable Mahamogallana. Once, when the Buddha was dwelling at Sungsumara Gita in Bhagga territory, Venerable Mahamogallana was meditating in the village called Kalala Valamutta in the Magadan country. He was drowsing in his meditation seat when the Buddha saw him with his divine eye since he was invigilating him from a distance. Then the Buddha approached him through his psychic powers and as if catching him napping said, Aren't you drowsing, Moggallana? Aren't you drowsing, Moggallana? Venerable Moggallana admitted to his weakness, and the Buddha gave a systematic course of treatment to it, as if administering seven waking pills, the peerless physician, cum surgeon, that he is. 1. If that is so, Moggallana, Whatever perception you had when drowsiness overcame you, that perception you should not attend to. That perception you should not make much of. 2. If that drowsiness does not leave you even when you are dwelling this way, then, Moggallana, you should think about, reason out, and mentally ponder over the Dhamma as you have heard and learnt it. 3. If that drowsiness does not leave you, even when you are dwelling in this manner, then, Moggallana, you should recite at length the Dhamma as you have heard and learnt it. 4. If that drowsiness still persists, even when you are dwelling in this way, then, Moggallana, you should pull both your earlobes and go on rubbing your limbs with the palm. 5. If that drowsiness does not leave you, even when you are dwelling like this, then, Moggallana, you should get up from the seat, rub water over the eyes and look around in the directions and look up at the stars in the sky. 6. If that drowsiness does not leave you, even when you are dwelling like this, then, Moggallana, you should attend to the perception of light. Determine the perception of day. Just as day, so is night. Just as night, so is day. Thus, with a clear, unshrouded mind, develop a luminous mind. 7. If that drowsiness does not leave you, even when you are dwelling this way, then, Moggallana, determine the pacing up and down, Chankamana, being conscious of the behind and the before, Pachapure Sanyi, with sense faculties turned inwards and with mind unstrayed. If that drowsiness is not abandoned even as you are dwelling this way, then, Moggallana, you assume the lion's sleep lying to the right side, placing one foot on the other, mindful and fully aware, attending to the perception of waking up. And on waking up, Moggallana, 
you should get up quickly with the idea, I will not dwell giving way to the ease of lying down, the ease of contact and ease of drowsiness. Thus should you, Moggallana, train yourself. This exhortation makes it clear that the meditator should try to maintain the seated posture which is more restful and take to the walking posture, chankamana, only as the last resort in one's course of training for overcoming drowsiness. One should not uncritically interpret the onset of drowsiness as an invitation to the promenade. Owing to the necessity of a fixed timetable, in some meditation centers the routine of one hour sitting and one hour walking is recommended. It is true that it affords a certain amount of training to the beginner, but if even a beginner builds up some concentration, samadhi, towards the end of the period of four sitting, it is not advisable to make it compulsory for him to break that samadhi and go to the chankamana. However, it might occur to a certain meditator who had mastered the training for wakefulness, Jagariya Yoga, by following the instructions given by the Buddha, that the chankamana is more conducive to his concentration according to his character. If that is so, there is nothing wrong in his spending a greater part of his time in the chankamana. Generally speaking, the reclining posture is not very advisable for a meditator because of its proximity to sleep. But in the case of a meditator who has done excessive pacing up and down to the point of restlessness, it may so happen that in the reclining posture, his restlessness subsides, allowing a balancing of spiritual faculties, heralding the attainment of concentration and wisdom. Venerable Ananda's attainment of arahanthood could be an illustration of the above psychological norm. He probably thought it unbecoming of him to attend the first council for reciting Dhamma Vinaya scheduled for the following day as a non-arahant, and spent the greater part of the night in the chankamana, developing mindfulness relating to the body. At last, when he was retiring to the bed, his mind became influx-free and emancipated just at the moment he was lowering his head to the pillow, having sat on the bed. Traditionally, it is regarded as a unique feat on the part of Venerable Ananda that he attained arahanthood free from the four postures. But there could be some other reason for it. As he had resolved on rigorous mindfulness on all four postures with the firm determination, I must somehow or other attain arahanthood before the morrow. He was bound to all four postures with restlessness. The only interval left open for him was the easily overlooked posture junction. Most probably the balancing of faculties occurred accidentally or automatically at the posture junction between sitting and reclining, which he had not reckoned with. Provided a meditator is careful enough not to give way to restlessness in the chankamana, he can reap the fruits of his efforts even at the end of the promenade. Commentators record instances of meditators attaining arahanthood even in the chankamana. Therefore, one should by no means underestimate the importance of chankamana meditation in the daily routine of a meditator. The Place for a Promenade Pacing up and down with mindfulness within a certain limit is generally regarded as walking meditation. Therefore, 
a suitable venue for it has to be prepared. A chankamana could be either indoors or outdoors. Traditionally, the length recommended for an outdoor chankamana is either 100 feet or 75 feet or 35 feet, and the width is 60 inches. There should also be a border or an access, upachara, about one foot broad around the chankamana, some four inches lower to prevent the intrusion of reptiles, etc., to the chankamana proper. The chankamana should be prepared on level ground, with a thin layer of fine sand to walk upon. At one end of the chankamana, a meditation seat should be made preferably with a roof above it. All these specifications are not so essential. One can improvise a chankamana in a meditation center or in one's home garden, with a border of bricks around a sand-strewn stretch of a narrow walk. Even if the chankamana is long, one should learn to walk slowly, and even if it is broad, one should be mindful enough to pace up and down in a straight line. As a result of such training, what a meditator leaves on the chankamana at the end of a long period of walking meditation is only a sign of footsteps, like a footpath with a circle at either end, provided the chankamana is sand-strewn. The indoor chankamana should be prepared inside a building, in a place where there is good ventilation. It should be about 45 feet long and sufficiently broad with a seat at one end. It could be useful to a strenuous meditator to have a rope running overhead, alambana raju, to hold on and pause when tired or else some sort of a railing on one side as a support. Even in one's residence, whenever and wherever practicable, one can temporarily determine a corridor or a veranda as a chankamana, provided there is sufficient seclusion and freedom from interference. Advantages of Walking Meditation Panchi me bikkave chanka me anisangsa katame pancha adhana kamo hoti padhana kamo hoti appa badho hoti asita pita kaita saitang samma parinamang gachati Chankamadhigato samadhi chirathiti kohoti. Chankamani sangsa sutta anguttara nikaya. Monks, there are these five advantages of the use of a promenade. Which five? 1. Can walk long distances. 2. Can put forth strenuous effort. 3. Has few ailments. 4. Whatever is eaten, drunk, chewed, and tasted is well digested. 5. Concentration attained in the promenade lasts long. 1. By slowly pacing up and down in an orderly manner within the limits of the promenade, the fatiguing feeling of distance does not come up. One comes to understand that a journey is only a succession of paces. Even in walking long distances, if one simply converts it to a relaxed pacing with mindfulness, one can get rid of the concept of distance so far covered and distance yet to be covered, which brings fatigue and experience a wonderful walk in the present. Provided one is barefooted, one can also attend to the touch sensation of the soles of the feet. 
and get an impression of having walked on an escalator. Thereby, one feels that the long journey has become short. The pause at either end of the chankamana minimizes fatigue and controls speed of walking. That is why one can spend a long time in the chankamana. A mind accustomed to this speed control is prepared to accept even a long journey on foot as a relaxed pacing on a chankamana. How the meditative monks of the past, who did long treks, charika, all on foot, without resort to vehicles, with a measured tread, restrained by the disciplinary rules of procedure, seikiya, covered unimaginable long distances, is something that the speed-crazy modern world racing with time can hardly understand. 2. By pacing up and down in a promenade, sleepiness goes away and wakefulness comes up. The body gets some exercise which dispels laziness. One becomes lively enough to put forth energy. By using the chankamana for a long stretch of time with a firm determination, the mind is preconditioned for resolute effort in the meditation seat. As it is said, one arouses an interest, chandang janeti, puts forth effort, vayamati, stirs up energy, viryang arabhati, steadies one's mind, chittang pagganhati, and strives resolutely, padahati. That pacing up and down paves the way to strenuous effort, which reaches its peak in the meditation seat. Venerable Sona Kolivisa, who was born with such a delicate body that his palms and soles had hair on them, and yet put forth the utmost exertion on the chankamana, and was declared by the Buddha to be the foremost etadagga among his disciples who are strenuous in striving, because he walked until the chankamana was wet with his blood. The Buddha had to convince him of the necessity of balancing the spiritual faculties by giving the simile of the lute with strings neither too taut nor too slack. 3. Pacing up and down, especially in an outdoor chankamana, where there is good ventilation, is conducive to health. Spending a long time in the chankamana invigorates the body. Any rheumatic pains, disturbances of the wind element, and other complications that may arise due to a long sitting session would be alleviated in the chankamana. Even for a bedridden patient who can still move about with some difficulty, an occasional aided walk could minimize ailments. Those points in the soles of the feet which need massaging, according to reflexology, would get massaged automatically in the chankamana, thereby curing some bodily disorders. Even for heart patients, the alternation between walking and standing in the chankamana prevents fatigue by providing a moderate type of exercise. 4. To one who sits after eating comes plumpness. To one who stands, growth of strength. To one who walks, longevity. And to one who runs, death is always close at the heels. Vyasakara. According to this saying of the ancient seers, standing and walking postures are preferable to sitting after the meal because they are conducive to proper digestion. Pacing up and down as an interim posture between sitting and running 
gives a light type of exercise to the body, which helps the proper functioning of the digestive system. Moreover, the dull indolence that comes after the meal tends to drowsiness, for which chankamana is an antidote. 5. Generally, the quietude in the meditation seat is helpful in attaining a level of concentration, samadhi. But due to attachment to the bliss of concentration, sometimes, imperceptibly, sloth and torpor may set in. On the other hand, that wakefulness in the chankamana helps one to stabilize a samadhi already attained provided that the standing and turning round at either end of the chankamana is done with mindfulness and full awareness, one can effectively conduct one's meditation topic in the chankamana without interruption and attain a level of concentration. The phrase Chirathiti ko hoti in the Chankamani Sangsa Sutta gets the following commentary in the Manuratthapurani commentary to the Anguttara Nikaya. Chirathiti ko hoti chirang tithati tithake na gahita nimittang hi nisinnasa nassati nisinne na gahita nimittang nippanan nassa chankamang adithahante na chalita rammane gahita nimittang pana tithassapi nisinnassapi nipannassapi nanassati Lasts long means persists for a long time. Why? Because the sign grasped while standing is lost when one is seated. The sign grasped while sitting is lost when one lies down. But in the case of one who determines on using a chankamana, the sign grasped on a meditation topic while moving is not lost when one stands or sits or lies down. Steadying the mind on a moving meditation sign is difficult, but for the same reason it is more stable. Serenity in the Promenade One can develop serenity, samatha, or insight, vipassana, or both serenity and insight in the chankamana. However, for facility of assessing facts, we shall discuss serenity in the chankamana as a separate chapter. When pacing up and down with a meditation topic meant for serenity, it is advisable first of all to pace up and down several times with mindfulness and arouse a relaxed rhythm of pacing. Then one can call to mind a term like arahang or buddho in the case of recollection of the Buddha, buddhanussati, or a phrase like may you be happy in the case of meditation on universal love or metta, and continue pacing up and down with unbroken mindfulness attending to it. A brief pause at either end of the promenade preferably with closed eyes, attending to the meditation topic, and mindfully turning round right about is conducive to concentration. One can make use of the promenade even when developing such visual meditation topics like the skeleton, atika, the bloated corpse, udhumataka, and the livid corpse, vinilaka, for instance, while continuously attending to the skeleton, 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 if the learning sign, uggaha nimitta, appears clearly enough, one can remain standing at the end of the promenade for some time, attending to it. If the counterpart sign, patibhaga nimitta, also comes up, 
one can develop it seated at the end of the promenade. If the sign appears in rough outline even to one's open eyes, one can carry it about like one's own shadow. Then one gets the ability to look around with the perception of the skeleton, atika sanya, for instance, at the end of the promenade. When one can pace up and down, not only with a meditative mind, but also with a meditative eye, there is less occasion for distraction by one's environment. The preparatory practice of conducting a meditation topic in the Chankamana is one that encourages the practice of carrying the meditation topic even on one's alms round. Gata pacha gata vata, going and coming with one's meditation topic. Scriptures record instances of meditative monks who looked at visual objects tending to defilements with a meditative eye and attained arahanthood while on their alms round. Although anapanasati, mindfulness of in and out breathing, is a meditation specially meant for the seated posture. One who has practiced it for a long time can arouse it even in the chankamana. If one walks mindfully, attending to the touch sensation at the soles of one's feet, it is easy to attend to the feel of the breath when one comes to the end of the chankamana. By determining to the Chankamana, in accordance with the last waking pill the Buddha had administered to Venerable Mahamugallana, that is to say, pacing up and down, being conscious of the behind and the before, with sense faculties turned inwards and mind unstrayed, one can arouse the sign of Anapanasati in the Chankamana without much difficulty. Concentration thus aroused in the chankamana could be maintained for a long time in the meditation seat, because, as we mentioned before, the wakefulness and vigor derived from the chankamana keeps away drowsiness. Insight in the Promenade Meditating zealously in the Chankamana, mindfully and fully aware, with radical attention, Yodiso Manasikara, one can arouse the knowledge of name and form, Nama Rupa, develop insight and attain Nibbana. For the purpose of accelerating attention, one has to slow down the pacing gradually. As he goes on slowing down, the meditator becomes aware of a number of stages in the process. Generally, six stages are traditionally distinguished, but there could be slight differences in naming them. Here is one method. 1. Lift. 2. Bend. 3. Send. 4. Drop. 5. Put. 6. Press. After getting down to the Chankamana, for a start, one may pace up and down lightly several times so that one can arouse the wieldiness necessary for this delicate type of exercise. Then, one can simply note the pacing as left-right for a short while, attending also to the touch sensation of the soles of the feet. It is good to pause a little at the end of the chankamana and get used to the turning by the right with mindfulness. As already mentioned, if the chankamana is sand-strewn and the pacing is done mindfully in a way that it leaves traces of a footpath, after some time circles would be drawn at either end of the chankamana. This method is helpful in getting used to pacing mindfully without allowing the mind to get distracted. As one progresses this way, the speed of pacing will be controlled gradually. 
if by now one can effortlessly distinguish three stages as lifting, sending, putting down, one may attend to three stages. With more practice, in due course one also becomes aware of the bending of the lifted foot. Further practice, accompanied by keener and keener attention, will enable the meditator to catch up with the other stages gradually, namely, sending, dropping, putting, and pressing. When attention is able to pick up all the six stages almost effortlessly, the meditator will become aware that there is a cyclic rhythm in pacing, and that his entire attention is on it. Since simultaneous with the pressing of the front foot comes the lifting of the foot behind, attention gets no opportunity to slip out. Even for a spectator outside, this wheel-like cyclic pacing movement would illustrate the advantages of unbroken mindfulness. Even as one is distinguishing these six stages, keeping one's body erect, the speed of pacing will be greatly reduced, but the speed of attending will increase in proportion to it. Thereby, one becomes aware of the possibility of a series of interim stages of attention. That is to say, being able to attend to the preceding intention that prompts the above stages. For example, intending to lift, lifting, intending to bend, bending. However, there is something special that needs mentioning. The meditator might expect to get 12 stages in all when the interim stages just mentioned are also mastered. But be it noted that only 11 stages can actually be distinguished. Although one can attend to the intention to drop and dropping of the foot, one can attend to the intention to put and putting for the simple reason that the end of dropping is effortlessly enough putting. What we have outlined above is a technique to practice meditation of pacing up and down, chankama, in a way to arouse penetrative insight. Briefly stated, its advantage is the understanding of the constituents of name and form by accelerating attention. This meditation is helpful in arousing a keener understanding of the functioning of the constituents of name, i.e., feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention. With the awareness of the process of preparations, or sankharas, involved in the pacing, the perception of the compact, ghana sanya, nurtured by egoism, tends to get liquidated, giving way to the perception of the heap, rasi sanya. The impermanence of preparations, or sankharas, could be seen then and there. By paying keener attention to the above-mentioned stages, one becomes aware of the arising and ceasing of a heap of vibrations. The touch sensation at the soles of the feet provides the hint to the understanding of the form aspect of name and form. Flashes of insight that occur during pacing could become fruitful at the end of the promenade. Pausing for a while and turning right about mindfully could be helpful in this concern. Attending to the breath in the case of anapanasati and fixing the mind on the visual sign that occurs in the light of the three sinyatas, impermanence, suffering, and non-self, anicca, dukkha, and anatta, in the case of such cemetery meditations like the skeleton, the bloated corpse, and the livid corpse, could usher in insight. Meditation on the four elements and the perception of impermanence could be effective at the end of the promenade. 
if one can gradually reduce the speed of walking and sharpen the attention to muster all the eleven stages in attending, the perception of the compact regarding the objects of the six senses would get attenuated, giving way to the perception of heap almost effortlessly. The sense data flowing in through the six senses eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and the mind, could then be subsumed under a finer four-fold category, i.e., the seen, ditta, the heard, sutta, the sensed, muta, and the cognized, vinyata. The gist of the realization that comes along with it could be worded as follows. 1. No one to see and nothing to see. Only a scene is there. Dite dita matang. 2. No one to hear and nothing to hear. Only a herd is there. Sute suta matang. 3. No one to sense, i.e. through nose, tongue and body, and nothing to sense. Only a sensed is there. Mute mutamatang. 4. No one to cognize and nothing to cognize. Only a cognized is there. Vinyate vinyatamatang. Out of these four, the herd is subtler than the seen, and the sensed is subtler than the herd. Now, if the interest, chanda, with which attention, manasikara, released from the sensed, is searching for an object, is stilled then and there, the realization comes that the object, dhamma, or thing, is mind-made. This seeing through, that mind-consciousness arises depending on mind and mind-object, i.e. dhammas, is the insight into the interior of the magic show of consciousness. With this insight, consciousness ceases or subsides. Vinyana nirodha, vinyanupasama. The farthest limit of radical attention is wisdom, panya. With the luster of wisdom comes the deliverance from the magical illusion of consciousness and the realization of nibbana. Rooted in interest, desire, friends, are all things. Born of attention are all things. Arising from contact are all things. Converging on feeling are all things. Headed by concentration are all things. Dominated by mindfulness are all things. Surmountable by wisdom are all things. Yielding deliverance as essence are all things. Merging in the deathless are all things. Terminating in Nibbana are all things. Anguttara Nikaya Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu